Well, if you're joining us this morning and this is your first week with us, we want to welcome you and you're catching us at a great time. We're working our way through Jesus' most famous sermon. And I asked several people, I said, we're going to go through Jesus' most famous sermon before we started this series. And all of them gave me the, an the same answer. That sermon is the Sermon on the Mount, and it's found in Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bible with you this morning, and I hope you do, would you open with me to Matthew chapter 5? And today we're going to focus in on verse 4, but before we get into that, I think there's something powerful about reading Scripture together, just speaking the Word of God out loud together. So we're going to read this passage. I don't know what translation you have there, but we're going to be reading in the New King James Version, and it will be on the screen behind me. In fact, let's put that first slide up. And so you can follow along right up here on the screen, or if you have a New King James Version available, you can follow along in your Bible. But let's read this out loud together. This is the introduction. You know, the Sermon on the Mount spans Matthew 5 through 7, three whole chapters. This is the introduction to that sermon known as the Beatitudes. Let's read this together. Ready? Matthew 5. 1 through 16. And seeing, seeing the, the multitudes, multitudes he, went he went up on a mountain, mountain and when, when he was seated, his, his disciples, disciples came, came to him. him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Wow, these are the words of our Lord, of our King, Jesus Christ. This is the introduction, and all these Beatitudes set up the sermon that follows. And all these Beatitudes can be seen in the life of Jesus in the teachings of Jesus, in the life of his disciples, and in the teaching of his disciples. Jesus had a very specific purpose in this particular sermon. His desire was that through his words, that his disciples would become more like him. More like you, Jesus. That's the desire of our hearts. He wanted his disciples to know what it looked like for the life of God to be lived through them. So last Sunday, we learned that Jesus wanted his disciples to be like him. And we looked specifically at Matthew 5, 3, that his disciples wanted him to be like him by being poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means to be spiritually bankrupt, totally dependent on God. Or in spirit. I mean, after all, he was God in human flesh, mm -hmm. and he never, ever sinned. Not one time did he ever betray the holy law of his heavenly Father. 
So how was Jesus poor in spirit? Well, first of all, he emptied himself. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that in a number of different ways in a number of different places. He emptied himself of all equality with God. He never became less than God, but he emptied himself as far as that position. Mm -hmm. He emptied himself of all equality with God, and he made himself 100% dependent upon his heavenly Father for his existence in this world and the spiritual condition of his soul. Mm -hmm. He wanted to live out for his followers what it was like to be poor in spirit. Yeah. To be dependent upon the Heavenly Father. And so that's how Jesus was poor in spirit. Yeah, the incarnation is miraculous. That we see the life of God lived out in human flesh. And Jesus was frequently demonstrating his poverty of spirit to his disciples. His willful choice to model this for us. And there's several places we can see that. But let me just show you three in the book of John, John 5, 19 says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. That's poor in spirit. But what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And then John 5, 30, Jesus said, I can, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Can you see how Jesus modeled being poor in spirit? In John 8, 28, then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus was poor in spirit, and he wanted his disciples to be more like him. So he made himself poor in spirit. And you see it here. I mean, here's three different times. Brandon read them to us. Three different times, just in a short amount of time in Scripture, where he said, I can do nothing. I mean, he, this is God in human flesh. And he's saying, I can do nothing apart from the Father. Totally, utterly, completely poor in spirit, relying on the Father for his very existence and his very life. Mm. And so he wanted his disciples to be poor in spirit like him. We also learned last Sunday that to be poor in spirit is the foundation for all the other Beatitudes. What that simply means is this. Uh, this morning we're looking at blessed are the more, uh, the blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted. Well, you're not going to mourn if you're not first poor in spirit. Right. You got to be poor in spirit. Mourning, we're going to discover, is built upon the foundation of being poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's only those who are poor in spirit that become meek, you know. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. All of those beatitudes, and in, in the entirety of the rest of the sermon, it's all built upon this first admonition that Jesus gave his disciples. We cannot ascend to the mountain of these other Beatitudes in this sermon without first being poor in spirit. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones compared it to a ladder. And the first rung in the ladder, if you want to get to the other rungs, the first rung in the ladder is being poor in spirit. And we're not going to get to the others unless we first are poor in spirit in our life. And so... That brings us to this next beatitude after poor in spirit. And Brandon, what is it? Yeah, so watch this develop in Jesus' sermon right here as he starts. And I'm going to go over the first four verses again. Watch how the next one builds on poor in spirit. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now this Greek word that it, we translate mourn, remember we have an English Bible. We're translating from uh, the Greek in the New Testament. 
And so this Greek word that we translate mourn is this word pentheo. Pentheo is the way we transliterate it into the English from the Greek. And what it means is, it simply means to have sorrow over something that we've lost. To have sorrow over something that we have lost. But it's also translated to wail. In other words, to really grieve outwardly over something that you've lost. What we know is this, we all lose something that is significant during the course of our lives. And we all experience, as a result, grief. Grief is that sense of loss. Mm -hmm. But mourning, mourning is the outward expression of our sorrow over what we've lost. And in that way, do you know that many people have grief, but they never mourn? In other words, they just stuff their grief. They don't admit that they have a sense of loss. And they never mourn over it like they should. And that's not healthy to do. No. And so Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. They wail, yeah. for they shall be comforted. And to understand what is it that brought Jesus to this place of not just grief, but mourning. Where he himself wailed mourned over what was it that would bring jesus to that place i mean we want to understand the words of jesus he's the one who said blessed are those who mourn well jesus in the gospels there are two examples of jesus weeping in the gospels what is it that brought jesus to this to be more like jesus we have to become people who mourn like jesus mourns so what brought jesus to a point of mourning. Look at Luke 19, 41 through 44. It says, now as he drew near, he was on his way to Jerusalem. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. That's that word. He mourned over Jerusalem. Why? He says, saying, if you had known, even you, especially this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And by the way, these words of Jesus came to pass no, in did. 70 AD. And level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon the, another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus mourned over the city of Jerusalem because Jerusalem laid in darkness when the light had come. Yeah. They missed the light of God and instead they remained in the darkness of sin and he wept over that. He mourned about that for Jerusalem. And then look at John 11, 32 through 35. Remember Jesus' dear friend Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha and Lazarus had just passed away. And Jesus came to visit Mary and Martha. And the scripture says that when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, Come and see. And Jesus wept. You know, in both these examples, Jesus is weeping over sin and over the effects of sin in people's life. Over the pain of sin. Over the grief of sin. In both these examples, with Jerusalem and the city that laid in darkness and Lazarus for the wages of sinners' death, Jesus is mourning and weeping over sin and over the effects of sin. Yeah, and we shouldn't assume that these were the only two instances in the life of Jesus that he wept over the sin of others mm -hmm. and also over the pain that they were experiencing <clears throat> because of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if we go to the prophet Isaiah, here's what he said about the Messiah. He said this in Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised and rejected by men, 
and he labeled the Messiah, who we know as Jesus, he was labeled, what characterized him as a man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. Wow. wow. Acquainted with grief. Hmm. Now, this Hebrew word that's translated uh, here as far as acquainted is the word yada. And what it means is, is it means to know someone or something in a very familiar way. So it's saying, Isaiah was saying the Messiah was going to be very familiar with grief. He was going to be very familiar with mourning. Hmm. So Jesus was a man of sorrows because he was a humble and compassionate person who deeply cared about other people. And he mourned because of the pain that he saw other people in or he saw what was coming and he mourned over the pain of what he saw was going to happen to people as a result of living in this fallen world that we live in. And he wanted his disciples to be like him, yeah. not only to be poor in spirit, but if they were poor in spirit, he knew that they would become men and women of sorrows themselves. This meant that his disciples would mourn over sin and the pain that sin causes others just like he did. Yeah, and so are you catching it yet? Right now, by this point, looking at Jesus' life and this sermon that he preached, you should be arriving at this conclusion. To become more like Jesus, I must become someone who mourns like him. If you're taking notes, that's the first thing to write down. To become more like Jesus, I must become someone who mourns like him. I must become someone who mourns over the things that he mourns over. We can't be like Jesus unless we mourn like him. So what does it look like to align our hearts with Jesus and to become more like him in the way that we mourn? And I want us to look at two points this morning, and we can take both of these points one at a time to look at what does it look like what does it look like to become more like Jesus in the way we mourn? So the first one is Jesus taught his disciples to mourn over their own sin. Think about that. Jesus taught his disciples to mourn over their own sin. Sometimes we can be really quick to jump past that one. And after that, Jesus wanted his disciples to mourn over the sins of others. Those are the two points. So let's take them one at a time. The first one, Jesus taught his disciples to mourn over their own sin. You know, everyone mourns. This is something that happens in all of our lives. All of us, when we lose something that is important to us, we mourn. The most common use of the Greek word that we translate mourn is when people, what people experience when someone that they deeply care for passes away. When someone you love dies, that's the most common feeling of this word, mourn. That's what it feels like to mourn. That's what it feels like to grieve like what Jesus is talking about. You know, we all mourn over some things, but not everyone mourns over their sin, and not everyone mourns over the losses that their sin causes other people the pain that their sin causes other people i mean wouldn't that be exceptional yeah. if everyone in the church mourned over their sin the way that jesus wants us to mourn if all of us were broken we wailed and weeped over our sin and the pain that our sin caused other people can't you see how that's being like jesus mm -hmm. the compassion of jesus i don't want my sin to cause you Pain, and I truly am sorry to the point that I mourn over my sin. I'm broken about my sin. You know, Jesus never sinned, so he never had to mourn over his own sin. But Jesus wanted his disciples to be like him and to mourn over the loss that their sin caused others. And that's the example that we do have in Jesus. When other people were suffering, even because of their own sin, Jesus wept with them. Mm -hmm. Jesus mourned with them. He mourned over Jerusalem. It was sincere. 
It was authentic. He was truly broken for the pain that the sins of the people in that city were bringing upon themselves. And he mourned. He wanted his disciples to stop being part of the problem that sin causes in this world. And he wanted them to start being part of the solution. He came to resolve that sin problem. And he wanted them to join him in that. For them to do that, they would have to learn to mourn over sin. Paul said that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. You see some of Paul's compassion here. His goal is not to make people sad, but he doesn't regret that he made them sorry. Listen to that heart continue. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, I rejoice that you felt sorry. Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Paul understood a type of mourning, a type of sorrow that led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produ produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourself. What indignation. What fear. What vement, de desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this manner. So Jesus knew this and he understood this about his disciples. Just as Paul expressed this godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Jesus knew that the natural tendency of mankind is to defend ourselves when we are wrong. Can you give us an amen on that one? Isn't that the natural tendency? Rather than mourning over our sin, our natural tendency is to immediately defend ourselves when we do wrong. I felt this last night when my son Jackson was talking to me and telling me how something I did embarrassed him. He's 10 years old and something I did embarrassed him. And, you know, it was really easy for me to think that, well, that doesn't matter. What I did wasn't really that wrong. I wasn't in the wrong here. Man, that's a hard feeling to overcome. That's a hard emotion to overcome, to put myself in a position where I can associate with his feelings and how my actions caused him to feel. So Jesus knew that the natural tendency of mankind is to defend ourselves when we are wrong. He wanted his disciples to be humble, compassionate people who were broken by the, the pain that their sin caused others. Whew. If this changed in us, if this defined us, think about what the Lord would do in our hearts and how he would lead us to be part of the solution for sin rather than the problem of sin. Their repentance of sin would make them part of that solution rather than part of the problem. Well, to be a part of the solution, not only did he want them to humble themselves and mourn over their sin, but he wanted them to do their part to relieve the pain that they'd caused as a result of their sin. And so remember now, the rest of the sermon is built upon these Beatitudes. And you can connect the dots if you'll look at it what Jesus was teaching his disciples to do. And so he taught them to mourn over their sin, like he mourned over mm -hmm. their sin. He said they'd be blessed. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then he gave them instructions for what to do when they had sinned against someone else. And so in Matthew 5, 23, he said, Therefore, and they were Jews, okay? They were practicing their religion as Jews. All of his disciples were practicing their religion as Jews. And they were constantly bringing these gifts to the altar and at the temple and offering those gifts at the altar. But what he said to them was really radical. Mm -hmm. He said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, just leave your gift there before your altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, 
you know, the Pharisees, what they would do is they would sin against people and not be concerned about the damage that their sin was causing others. And they would enter into the temple and they would offer their gifts and they'd offer their sacrifices and think that made everything right. Well, we know about what God wants. God's more concerned about our heart than our outward practices. And what he wanted to see was a heart of compassion for people that if you've injured someone due to your sin, that you would go to them and make things right with them. You know, here's what happens that we tend not to recognize. When we sin, we cause others to lose. Yeah. Every time, we cause others to lose when we sin. So, Brandon did something that caused his son to be embarrassed. It may have not even been a sin, but it caused pain in his son. And so, whatever he did caused his son to lose. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because he was embarrassed by what Brandon did. And we all will do that as parents. We'll all do that in all of our relationships. Yeah. But the heart of Jesus is, I want to relieve you of that pain. Yeah. So what can I do not to embarrass you again? Yeah. Whether I sinned or not is not the issue. The issue is you're in pain. How can I relieve you of that pain? That is the heart of God. Yeah. And so throughout our lives, we go in this process of offending other people and we're, we're, we have this natural tendency just to, you know, make it all about I'm right, you're wrong. Do you understand that's really not the heart of God in this? Yes, he is holy. He is concerned about right and wrong. No question about it. But the primary reason that he's concerned about right and wrong is that when we do wrong, it hurts people. Yeah, it does. It brings pain to people. Yeah. And he wants us to have his heart. His heart is to relieve us of pain. Right. Right? That's what he wants us to, to <laughs> that's why he came. Yeah. Was to relieve us all of pain, the pain of sin yeah. in our lives. He wants us to be like that in our relationships with each other. Yeah, and this has got to start in our marriages. Church, this has got to start there. The words that are spoken and the voice tones that are used that invite pain from sin into those relationships, we have got to become people who are meek. We'll get to that next week. Yeah, the people that are closest to us. If yeah. you're not married, it's the people that are closest to you. Yeah. Those I mean, it's got to begin right there in the way that we relate to one another. Oh, I hurt you? Yeah. Wow. I'm, I mean, tell me about it. Right. You know, tell me how I did that. What did that make you feel like? I really want to understand and know what I caused in you. What can I do differently so that I won't hurt you again? I mean, it's that simple, folks. That's the heart of God in reconciling relationships, and it should start in those relationships that are closest to us. But first, we have to be poor in spirit, and then we have to learn to mourn over our sin and the pain that our sin causes other people. If we don't do that, we'll never reach a point where we're humble like Jesus is humble, where we empty ourselves like Jesus emptied himself in order to relieve us of pain. We have to empty ourselves in order to relieve others of their pain. Yeah, if I don't like care him. that you're in pain, Brandon, how is that love? It's not. It's not love. If no. I don't care that you're in pain, if I'm not going to do my part, whatever my part might be, to relieve you of that pain, how, how can I say that I love you as a brother or as a, if, you know, if I'm talking with one of my sisters, I can't. Yeah. Some of us need to really think about this today. You know, there could be a prompting here, I believe there is from the Holy Spirit, to have a very difficult conversation for you because you're not accustomed to admitting that you're wrong in the most important relationships in your life. But the Holy Spirit wants to humble you to cause you to see how your sin is impacting another person and to be poor in spirit and to mourn over the pain your sin has caused so that you love that person enough to make it right. And that's, the, that's this next part is what Jesus taught his disciples through this leave your gift at the altar, go your way, first be reconciled, then come off your, offer your gift as he taught them this concept of making amends. Doing what I can do to relieve the pain of another person, especially when it was my actions that caused that pain 
in the first place. Doing our part to relieve others of loss and pain that our sins cause them means doing all we can to make amends. I think it's most clear in like financial situations. That's the easiest way to see this, where someone ends up like you steal from someone, or you're careless with something and you break something that wasn't yours, or you take out a loan and then you struggle to pay it back. There's a responsibility that we have to go back to that person that our decisions have injured or that our financial circumstances have created this loss for them and to go and make amends for it. Well, that's the, that's the idea for all these areas. We have got to become a type of people that work together to make amends, to really care about the loss we've caused others and do what we can. Now, there's a God's part, my part, their part in this. I can't do God's part to help them walk in forgiveness and for the healing of their soul. I can't do their part to forgive and to do what they need to do to make amends in this, but I can do my part. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 12, 18. He says to the church, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's what we have to do, that heart of making amends. So the first point here, Jesus wanted his disciples to be like him and to mourn over their own sin. Paul said a very important thing in Romans 12, 18. He said, if it is possible, it's not always possible to make amends for everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if you accidentally took someone's life, there's no way to make amends for that life being lost. And there's other things that we could use as an example. But as, but as much as it depends on us, he said, live peaceably with all men. So Jesus wanted his disciples to be like him and mourn over their own sin. But then also, Jesus wanted his disciples to mourn over the sins of others. Now, when Jesus wept over the people of Jer Jerusalem, he wept because he saw the pain that they were going to experience in their future because of their sin. And when he wept over Mary and Martha, he wept because he saw the pain that they were experiencing because of sin. The wages of sin is death, and death is very painful. And Jesus knew that the natural tendency of his disciples was not only to defend themselves when they were wrong, but also he knew that their natural tendency was to condemn others for their sin mm. rather than mourn over the pain that their sin was causing them whether they were guilty or not. Wow. And so we can see this natural tendency in us in the story of a Samaritan village that rejected Jesus. So his disciples come upon this village and, and Jesus uh, said to his disciples, he, went up to, he was going up to Jerusalem and it was his last time he was going to go before he was crucified. And he sent his disciples out before his face. And as they went... It says in verse 52, they entered into a village of the Samaritans uh, to prepare for Jesus' arrival. But the Samaritan village said, we don't want him here. They did not receive him because his face was set to go to Jerusalem. And so when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire from heaven to come down and consume this village? Just like Elijah did. Now, doesn't that sound like us? <laughs> yeah. Here's this village of people that's suffering because of their sin. They've rejected Jesus. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, that would be like an ultimate sin. Yeah. You know? And so here, that was, here what do they want to do? <laughs> you know, they want to condemn them. They're not thinking about the pain that the sin is causing those people. And, and what Jesus did, he turned, and what did he do? He rebuked them. They didn't share his heart. They were condemning the people who were sinful. And they did not share the heart of Jesus. He said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Well, he could have been real clear. What spirit is that? That's the devil, right? That's the devil. Wanting to bring pain and judgment down on people because of their sin? Yeah. Instead of seeing them relieved of their pain? That is the devil. And then he said, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. 
And then they just went on to another village. James and John got the message, we know, uh, by the way they lived right. after the resurrection of Jesus. But this is the natural tendency. This is how we can end up trying to respond in these situations. Someone sins against us, or we don't like how someone treated us. And so rather than mourning over their sin and the pain that their sin is causing, not only us, but themselves and others, we tend to jump to this tendency to condemn people and that's why in this sermon jesus said in matthew 7 1 through 5 judge not that you be not judged for with what judgment you judge you will be judged and with the measure you use it will be measured back to you Woo, those are scary words that we need to heed and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank in your own eye there we go back to point one your own sin first mourn over that or how can you say to your brother let me re remove the speck from your eye and look a plank is in your eye hypocrite first remove the plank from your own eye then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye jesus wanted them to mourn over their sin and the pain that their sin was causing he did not want them to jump to condemning other people people so you've got a speck in your eye and i see it you know and so instead of compassionately wanting to help you because a speck in your eye causes what pain pain okay and so instead of me wanting to help you get that speck out of your own eye to help you relieve of your pain i say to you you know what you deserve everything that you're experiencing right now well, what that demonstrates is I've got a log in my own eye. Yeah. Huh? I've got a log in my own eye, if that's my attitude, and I need to get the log out of my own eye, that log of judgment, out of my own eye so I can say, hey, brother, I'm sorry you're hurting because of that speck in your eye. Mm -hmm. How can I help you here? Yeah. You know, I want to help you so that you're not suffering, that you're not hurting like you are. Yeah. That is the heart of God. Hey, church, don't let anyone deceive you because there's a lot of false teaching out there right now in the Sermon on the Mount. And in, the, in that false teaching, you're being taught that mourning over sin is something that you should leave behind because you're under grace. There's a lot of confusion right now because of false teachers in the body of Christ. And you, you need to understand, you can mourn over sin, even your own sin. It doesn't mean that you're suffering from shame. Yeah, no, mourning over sin is God's grace. It is God's grace, When he grace, opens absolutely. my eyes to see my condition and what my sin is causing others, and I can't see that apart from his grace. That is grace. So you don't get saved by mourning over your sin, and then you leave mourning behind. No, what's going to happen to you by the Spirit of God is that you're going to mourn more yeah. over your sin, even then when you did when you were first saved. In fact... If Jesus is in a person, if he is in us, each one of these beatitudes is going to grow in us. Yeah. We're going to become more poor in spirit. We're going to become more mourning over sin and the pain that sin causes as we grow in Christ. Yeah, we're saying becoming like Jesus means becoming like him as a man of sorrows. Becoming familiar with grief, mourning over my sin and the sins of others. And you may be thinking right now, wow, that means I would be mourning all the time. Jesus said, blessed are those that mourn. How is that kind of mourning a blessing? Well, if you're thinking that way, you would be correct. Like I said, if you are in Christ and the Spirit of Christ is in you, then this characteristic of mourning is going to increase. It's going to grow uh, the more you grow in Christ. Uh, in fact, if you follow Jesus, here's the bad news in some people's minds. If you follow Jesus, mourning over sin will be a close, a close companion to you. Mm -hmm. And it will get closer and closer to you the longer you walk with Jesus. Mm -hmm. In fact, you will spend time with this friend of mourning every day the more you mature and the more you grow in Christ. You will continuously find yourself sharing in the grief that God experiences every day over the sin and the pain that sin is causing in our world. If you, will, if you follow Jesus, you're going to find yourself 
just continuously mourning with him. If you're really walking with Jesus, that's what's going to happen, and it's going to grow in you. The Apostle Paul described it this way in Romans 9. He said in verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual, continual grief in my heart. And he was talking about for his brethren, the Jews, who had rejected Jesus. Wow. And that's what's going to happen to you. That is an example of a mature disciple of Jesus. He has continual sorrow, great sorrow, over those who are rejecting Jesus and what sin is doing to them. Yeah, we need to become more like him. We need to learn to grieve like he grieves and allow ourselves to mourn. And you may be thinking... To live like that sounds like an awful way to live. Like, I don't want to I want to be happy. I right. don't want to be mourning all the time. I don't want to be mourning. And it would be, except there's a promise attached with this beatitude. And it's a very important promise for us to consider in light of this message and in light of what it looks like to be someone who mourns like Jesus mourns. In Matthew 5, 4, the scripture says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted what an incredible promise this would be a terrible way to live if not for this promise but we know that god's intent is to relieve us of pain and we know that he will bring us comfort one of the ways that god does that is we have this incredible hope of our future with jesus a world that is free from the condition of sin the problem of sin, that my body, sin in my flesh is going to be done away with and I get a new body, that this world that's under the curse of sin will be cast away and no more and we get a new heaven and new earth, that Satan, that great deceiver, will be locked up forever and we'll live in a place without sin and we have this hope. What a comfort that is. I mean, think about this picture in Revelation 21 where the Apostle John is having this vision of the future, and this is right after the great white throne of judgment. And I tell you, there's mourning there. There is grief and pain at the great white throne of judgment, but look at what happens immediately after that. John says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's comfort. There shall be no more death. That's comfort. No sorrow. No crying. There shall be no more pain. That is comfort. For the former things have passed away. Then he said, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these words, write for these words are faithful and true. What a comfort we have in Jesus for the hope of the future. Yeah, this promise that he gave about our future brings a measure of comfort now when we're going through sorrow. It, it tells us there's an ending. Yeah. And you know, it's very important for us to know there's an ending to our suffering. That brings us comfort. If we just think, hey, this is going to be the way that it's going to be for the rest of my life, for eternity, that's not very comforting. But the fact is, eternity is going to be minus pain, minus pain, minus weeping, minus sorrow. And that in itself brings us a measure of comfort about our future whenever we're experiencing pain. But what about right now? Yeah. What about right now when we're mourning? I mean, should we just go around with a gloom on our face all the time and, and be in mourning all the time? Well, some believers believe that, but that's really not the promise of this verse where it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, about uh, six years old the first time I remember being comforted by a woman. My dad had remarried. My mother died when I was three. I don't have any memories of my mother. I don't ever have any memories of her comforting me. And I'm, I wish I did, but I don't. And I was, my dad remarried, and her name was Fran. And uh, I remember one night when I was six, I got really, really scared. I was really afraid. I saw something in my window. 
and it looked like something that was threatening. And I was scared, and I started crying. I was six years old. And so here I was mourning because I was afraid. And my stepmother got up, and I'll never forget it. I'm telling you the story because I'll never forget it. She came down and sat by my bed, and, and she put her hand on me, and she spoke words of peace to me. Hmm. And I was comforted. Hmm. I'm telling you, how valuable is that experience when it happens to us? Hmm. And that's on the human level. That's just a human level of comforting, okay? Yeah, she was God's messenger to me, but that was a human level. You see, what Jesus said here was there's a comfort that's supernatural. Yeah. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Greek word that's translated comfort that Jesus used in Matthew 5, 4 is the word parakleo. And in what, here's what it means. It means to call near. Okay? Parakleo. Comfort means to call near. Okay? Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos in John 14, 26. He said, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the parakletos, is the word helper in that verse. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Wow, what a promise we have in the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When we mourn over sin, we invite the Holy Spirit to draw near to us. Wow. We invite him to be close to us because we're aligning our heart with his heart. See, we think we do that only when we praise and worship God. Mm -hmm. We do. We invite the presence of God to draw near to us when we praise and worship the Lord. But what this verse is saying is that when we mourn over sin, when we mourn over the pain that sin is causing others, or even mourn over our own sin, the Holy Spirit draws near to us. And the Holy Spirit is present in you if you are in Christ. He is with you and He is in you. That's the promise of Jesus. You are the hot spot of God's presence on the earth. In you He dwells. And this is that idea that Jesus spoke Follow me, that call to proximity, that call to walk with him, to become more like him, to keep in step with him. When we mourn over sin, we invite the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Do you want to be comforted, comforted by God? Do you want to experience God's comfort? Mourn over the things he mourns about. Become like Jesus in your mourning, and you will experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's like he comes and gives us a big hug. It's not a physical hug, but it's better. He manifests his presence in our soul in a way that is unexplainable and gives us hope and peace. He relieves the anxieties of our soul. He relieves the stress of our soul. The more we mourn over sin, the more we experience comfort of the Holy Spirit. In our closeness to him, we walk with him. We learn with him. We follow his example. We become more like him. You, more like you, Jesus, you know, I, morning. When I first learned this truth, it was many, many years ago. And when I first became a Christian, I didn't understand this truth. And I wanted the nearness of God in my life, you know. And, and I, you know, was searching for the nearness of God as a Christian. I wanted the manifest presence of God in my soul. And I had no idea until this truth was revealed to me that I could experience that by mourning. Mm -hmm. Mourning over my sin. Yeah. Mourning over the pain that my sin caused others. Mourning over the pain that others were experiencing. And so this became a, a normal part at some point in time of my spiritual walk with God mm -hmm. where basically daily I mourn over sin yeah and what do i experience i experience the comfort of the holy spirit it's an oxymoron i wouldn't trade it for anything yeah i mean would you trade the nearness of god for for anything no you know it's better to be a gatekeeper in the house of god than to be a rich man in this world with all of his possessions yeah right 
Let me ask you, has there ever been a time in your life when you became poor in spirit and you mourned over your, your sin before God? Hmm. Have you ever had a moment in time like that? Church, I want you to understand, don't be deceived here. You have not become a Christian unless that's happened to you. Unless you've had a time in your life where you became poor in spirit and mourned over your sin before God, you have not yet become a Christian. That is the first work of the Holy Spirit in bringing us to salvation, is to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment and to bring us to a place of brokenness in our soul over our sin before God. You know, the Holy Spirit does not draw people to Jesus by just offering them relief from their guilt and shame and the hope of a better life by praying a sinner's prayer. Mm -hmm. But yet that's what's being offered today from many pulpits. No, the Holy Spirit comes to us and he, he works in our soul and he causes us to be convicted and mourn over our sin. Yeah. He crushes our soul with the weight of the law of God. He makes our sin utterly sinful to us. And this revelation through the Holy Spirit is what causes us to mourn over our sin before God so that we can be converted. He shows us that we have no place to turn. Our soul is so absolutely destitute of any righteousness at all mm -hmm. that we have no place to turn but to Jesus for salvation from sin. And then, what does he do? He saves you. Right. But you have to go through that journey. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had that experience with God before? If you become poor in spirit and turn to Jesus to save your soul from sin, he will come to you without fail and make you a new creation in Christ. Mm. He will relieve you, yes, of your shame and the fear of God's divine judgment will be gone just like that. But you will become like Jesus and you will continuously mourn over your sin. You will have fellowship with his sufferings and his spirit will manifest himself to you and comfort you. Yeah. And I want you to know that is better than any love that you can receive from anyone else yeah. in this world. Yeah. Well, let's pray together this morning. Have you ever had that experience? Have you been converted? Where you saw the Holy Spirit made it clear to you that you were causing so much pain because of your sin. And you saw how utterly sinful your sin is. And you felt ashamed. And you felt afraid of God because of your sin. And in that moment, you turned to Jesus and said, save me. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Has that ever happened to you? Is it happening right now? Is the Holy Spirit doing that work in your soul right now? Through these words, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Father, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to fall upon us. Break down those walls of pride that have separated us from that fellowship with you that you so desire with us. Thank you, Father, that you want to relieve us of our pain. Thank you, Lord, that you don't enjoy our suffering, that you want to take it away. But Lord, you say there's only one way for us to be relieved, and that's through your son, Jesus. Father, right now, bring sinners to repentance. Bring sinners to repentance. Relieve them of their shame. Relieve them of the guilt of their sin. Make them like you, Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. 
In Jesus' name.